The scripture reading today is found in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and then 11 through 32. It's a scripture reading I think we're all familiar with. It's the parable of the uh, rather prodigal son. Now this story is probably more than 2,000 years old, but it can be upgraded today and it's just as relevant. You've got a thoughtless son who basically says, Dad, I wish you were dead because I want my inheritance now. Now there's a real thoughtful sibling for you. And the father relents and gives him the money. Well, he takes the money, nefariously spends it on a lot of foolishness, ends up dead broke, comes crawling back to his father, and here's where the story changes. The father does not rebuke him, but he welcomes him back home. And this is, the, this is where the father, when you really think about it, is our father in heaven. And he's always willing to forgive a sinner who repents. And this is the parable that we're about to read to you today. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parallel. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger man gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property by dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for our son of mine has dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and there began to celebrate. Now his oldest son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called out of the slaves and asked, what was going on? The slave replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours came back, who was, has devoured your property and with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead 
and he has come to life. He was lost and now has been found. Well, raise your hand if you have heard this story before. Okay. Raise your hand if you have heard it more than five times in your life. Mm -hmm. And now raise your hand if you've heard this story so many times that you have completely lost count of how many times you have heard it. All right. Well, a couple weeks ago, I took some time off, and my husband Rod and I drove down to the Flint Hills for a few days. And we headed out late one morning from our home up north. And the route was very familiar. 237, past Lake Perry, down to Highway 24, west on Highway 24 to 75 south to 70. And I have taken that road so many times, I have lost count. Well, I was very relaxed because, hey, I was on vacation. And it was the middle of the day, and Rod was driving, and I've seen all that stuff before. So I started to fall asleep. Well, that wasn't a whole lot of fun for Rod, so he said, hey, why don't you see if you can pay attention and see if you notice anything you haven't seen before. Well, okay, challenge accepted. And eventually... I did spot a few shops and a few signs and a few homes that I really had not noticed before. And when we hear or read a story like this very familiar parable of the man with two sons, it's easy to think we have heard it all, every insight, every scrap of good news that can be squeezed out of this story. But if we stay awake and pay attention we might notice something new. And here are some things that got my attention as I paid attention this week to this story. And first is the situation that Jesus addresses as he tells this story. Now what's going on is that the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling. Why? Because Jesus welcomes tax collectors and sinners and eats with them. And I think when we read the Gospels, we hear the phrase Pharisees and scribes, and we think bad guys, opponents who give Jesus a hard time. We don't have sympathy for the Pharisees and scribes, but the Pharisees were actually very faithful, very God-fearing teachers and interpreters of the law, They didn't hate Jesus. They were fascinated with him. They loved engaging him in conversation. One of my New Testament professors always liked to remind us in seminary that if Jesus had been part of any organized group back then, he would have been a Pharisee. He would have fit right in. And the phrase tax collectors and sinners is another phrase that has kind of lost its punch down through the centuries. Tax collectors made their money from charging people more than the actual tax that they owed. They could pocket the difference between what the people paid and what actually had to be turned over to the government. In other words, they exploited people for personal gain. And Jesus wasn't just polite to these folks. He spent meaningful time in fellowship with them. So just imagine that you have invited Jesus to be in your dinners for eight group. But instead of accepting your invitation to dine with a lovely group of compassionate, law-abiding Presbyterians, Jesus goes and has dinner with some of the parents who were caught up in the college admissions scandal and the guy who sells weed at the middle school, and a couple of human traffickers, and hey, let's just throw Harvey Weinstein in there too. Now, wouldn't you grumble just a tad? But it is to the grumblers, not the sinners, 
that Jesus tells this story. And that's our first interesting detail. The second interesting detail requires a shout out to two church members. Uh, Melanie McQuare from, uh, well, he's, she's on our session, our clerk of session. She learned at our women's Bible study and later shared with me that one aspect of this story that often gets passed over is the fact that there is a famine in the land where the younger son is living. And this is part of the story that readers in third world countries are quick to notice, but that we who live in the United States tend to miss. For us, famines are something we read about that happen to people far away. And so my second shout out is to Joe Mumford, who loaned me the book, The Indifferent Stars Above by Dan Brown. And this is a mesmerizing story of the Donner Party, the group that started out for California from Missouri in 1848 and due to a series of unfortunate choices and events, became trapped in the snow in the Sierra Nevada, ran out of food, and ended up consuming some of the deceased members of their party in order to survive. And besides being a terrifically well-told story, the book vividly describes how hunger and starvation affect your mind and body. And basically, when you are desperate, you find yourself doing things that you never imagined that you could do. And that's the situation of this younger son. He says to himself, I am dying of hunger. Now, when I say I am dying of hunger, I mean it's 7 p.m. and I haven't eaten anything since lunch. When the younger son in this story says this, he means it. He is dying of hunger. Of course, nobody will give him anything because there's a famine and everybody's just trying to keep themselves and their families alive. He doesn't have anybody. In the Donner Party, it was the single young men traveling alone without family who were the first to go. They died more quickly than anybody else. So up to this point, the younger son has done everything he could to avoid going home. But now he realizes if he doesn't get out of there, he's going to die. He is not going to make it. This is life or death. And so he's planning what to say to his father in order to get some food. Do you notice that? Can you hear that? This is what I say, and then maybe. And so when he's spotted staggering down the road by his father, this is not the same young man who left. He's emaciated. His cheeks are probably hollow. He's probably lost some teeth, probably some hair. Just imagine being a parent and seeing your child in this condition. Which brings us to a third thing that we might notice in a fresh way as we hear this story. The father never actually says anything to the younger son, but he instructs the servants to throw a party saying, the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He'll say the same thing a little bit later to his older son. He was dead. And aren't those just the best stories? The ones where their beloved is thought to be dead or hopelessly lost, but then they come back. Wesley in The Princess Bride, the two dogs and the cat in Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey, Aslan and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Castaway, Rip Van Winkle, The Odyssey, Persuasion. That could be a good party game. See how many stories you can list, which build on the theme that when all hope is gone, the loved one returns. And speaking of parties, 
the older son is not in a party mood. No, he's not. To his father, he says, and this is the fourth observation, when this son of yours came back, the older brother can't bring himself to call the younger son his brother. One night, I was driving home from church down 8th Street, getting ready to head on to the on-ramp on I-70 East, and I was at the stoplight at 8th and Monroe, and Monroe is a one-way street. You're only supposed to go south on Monroe. Well, as I'm crossing Monroe, bearing south to get onto the on-ramp, here comes a car driving north. They're going the wrong way. And the driver of this car starts honking at me as if I've done something wrong. So the driver was not only going the wrong way, they didn't even know they were going the wrong way, and consequently, they behaved like a, a jerk. And that's what this older son is doing by talking this way to his father and cutting himself off from his brother. In doing so, he becomes the one who is lost. And so the fifth and final detail for today is the way the father has to step across the doorway and out of his house not once but twice. Once for the younger son, once for the oldest. And now we know that the younger son had planned to ask his father to treat him like a hired hand instead of a son, but the father won't even let him get the words out. And the father also corrects his older son, saying, we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours, yeah, was dead and has come to life. The father reminds each of his sons, this is a family. We're a family. The party is not complete without the whole family. We're on the home stretch now with our current sermon series. Next week we have John Haspels in the pulpit to bring us a message about his time as a mission worker in Ethiopia with his wife Gwen. We'll wrap things up on Palm Sunday and then start something new after Easter. But today, we remember again our mission statement. Say it with me. Loving God, loving neighbors, and living with purpose. As we explore what it means to live with purpose, we look to Jesus because our purpose is to become more like Christ. And as a church, our purpose is to be the body of Christ in the world. When we look at today's passage, we see Jesus telling a story to show that the love of God is so much deeper, so much stronger, so much wider, and the grace of God is so much more amazing than we ever understand. God comes looking for all who are lost, whether they are lost in the manner of the younger son or lost like the older son. And sometimes, like the younger son, we need to pause and remember the mercy of our father and turn around and head for home. Sometimes, like the older son, we need to remember that the people who offend us the most are also our brothers and sisters. And that when we deny their place in the family of God, it is we who are lost. And as a church, our job, our purpose, is to do what Jesus did, to keep showing people through our own storytelling, through who we eat with, who we welcome and how, that God still seeks the lost, welcomes them home, and throws parties, and hands out the party blowers. And just as we cannot have Christmas Eve without Silent Night, or Easter morning without Jesus Christ is risen today, we cannot have the story of the prodigal son without amazing grace. 
So I invite us to stand now as we are able and sing together.